Everybody, thanks for being here. It is an exciting time to bring you one of my favorite topics of all time, and that is how to crush PCSO ideals, PCSOI is past client and sphere of influence. How do we crush this, and how does a team like ours average over 30 PCSOI deals per agent per time? And in comes Robbie T as well. Robbie, we have just kicked off. We are diving in, and I want to share with you folks, if you are watching live, ask some questions, put it in the chat box. We want to be able to answer all your questions. If you're watching the recording or the replay of this webinar, be sure to uh, post in the YouTube comments, and we will answer every last inquiry that you have. Let me tell you about Hatch Realty and Hatch Coaching. Uh, we are in Fargo, North Dakota. We do have a number of expansion offices as well. Uh, we are in... Grand Forks, North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota, Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, Fergus Falls, Minnesota, and in 11 little days, we open up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That'll be six markets for us, and we will this year, God willing, sell over 1,000 houses in 2021. First time we're breaking that four-figure mark, uh, last year we did 866, and here we're going to sell over 1,000. What's unique about us is a couple of things. Number one is that we're doing this with... 52 or so full-time team members, and then about a half dozen part-time team members. So we are selling a ton of houses per agent in production. It doesn't happen like that in most other places. A lot of times when you hear a team that's selling a thousand homes, they have a hundred plus people on their team. That's just not the way in which we do this. So we are going deeper instead of wider. That's super huge. The second piece and the actual topic of our time today is how are our agents selling so much to their PCSOI, past clients and sphere of influence. And that is where we're going because our agents in production that have been with us for at least a couple of years are averaging over 30. I have two agents that will do over 60 sphere deals this year. And they're choosing to stay on the team. It's pretty fascinating. Now, Robbie, my right hand, my main man, uh, is known as the ISA guru and all of this. Robbie, you've been an ISA or an ISA coach uh, since you got started in real estate. Give us your background into real estate, how this all came to be. Yeah, so my, my background is so different than most. Before I got into real estate, I actually worked on good old political campaigns. And the joke I always say is, if there's one thing that is less popular than sales, I guarantee you it's knocking somebody door, somebody's door to say, hey, Eric, who do you plan on voting for? All right, I got booed off people's doorsteps. So I uh, built some thick skin. Anyway, so that was my, my background. Um, when I came into real estate, I started as an ISA. So I was the guy, and people confuse what an ISA does. I was the guy who was managing the database, chasing down the leads, scheduling the follow-ups, actually following up with leads, and really nurturing leads. Um, to create opportunities for our agents. So my background was taking the lead on our leads as an ISA. So that was me. Mm -hmm. Now, most ecosystems and even our ecosystem early on, Robbie, mm -hmm. was heavily supported by the ISA role. Yes. Yep. Um, I did a lot of sphere production because I've been intentional with my life and my involvement in social media and, yep. and connections uh, with people. And so I'll, I'll go, uh, we'll use the year 2014 as an example. Mm -hmm. We closed 411 homes in 2014. Mm -hmm. 150 of those were my sphere. Okay, me working directly with people, 150. We probably had another 50 or so deals that came from our team's sphere. Mm -hmm. Right. We were a team. We started the year at 11 people. We finished at 19. And so each person was bringing in two to 10 sphere deals, nothing, nothing over the top. Mm -hmm. And then the other 211 deals roughly came from our ISAs, which were company purchased deals. Mm -hmm. Robbie, it's imperative if we're going to talk about PCSOI that we draw the line in the sand between what an ISA does in our ecosystem and what an agent does in our ecosystem, because that is, that is one of the core fundamentals as to why we have found this kind of success. So break that down for us. Yeah. So really it's actually, I think without having an ISA department, it is impossible to see the PCSOI production that our agents produce. I think 
lever number one that we did was we create, I mean, Hatch, you, you were an enigma, man, expecting that from other people. And the thing that you all need to know about Eric bringing in 150 SOI deals was he had the best job in the world to transition out of and have a huge SOI being a youth pastor, right? And you were very social, well-connected and an extremely likable, well-connected person. Um, a lot of people aren't in those types of shoes. But here's what it really comes down to. Yeah, is- Ro- Robbie, I never, I never expected the team to do what I did in Correct. terms of sphere deals. Uh-huh. I thought that my job was I'm going to fund the team with my sphere deals. <laughs> yep. And then uh, everybody else is going to take these deals that I purchase. Yep. My ISAs will convert. Yep. And then if they bring in a sphere deal, it's like a bonus to the company. Which is, I think, most people's perspective is, is simply that. Um, but really what we're getting at here is our ISA department chases the three out of four other leads that we always talk about. So we always talk about how there's four different types of leads. One is PCSOI, past clients, sphere of influence. So your past clients, your friends, your family, your godmothers, your mom's aunts, you know, whatever, maybe your mom's best friend. So PCSOI. Number two would be low hanging fruit. It's the second type of leads in real estate. That would be Zillow, Realtor.com, something like a home light, referral-based lead sources, Dave Ramsey's. Um, Low-hanging fruit is easier to convert, usually more expensive. Number three would be nurture leads. That's the Y Locos of the world. Um, Your PPC leads, buyer or seller PPC. Um, It is all those different longer-term opportunities. Usually these are cheaper and they take more long-term nurturing to convert. And then fourth is reputation. This basically comes from you usually having a big brand, you having a really great reputation in your market, really strategic partnerships. So people are seeking out you because of your reviews or maybe your your YouTube channel or maybe the brand that you have built on social media. It's your reputation leads. And number one, so our agents in our world, Chase number one, PCSOI, in our world now, our ISA department chases those other three, low-hanging fruit, the nurtures, as well as the reputation leads. All those flow to our ISA department. Now, I need to put a disclaimer on this for those of you that are listening. That does not mean we go hire an ISA today and turn all of that over to them. Okay, reach out to me. We'll give you much better guidance than that. But the ultimate goal, the thing that we work towards in our business was all company leads flowed to our ISAs, which frankly, Hatch, freed our agents up to prioritize lead generating to their PCSOI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well said, Robbie. And I will tell you that I learned the pain of giving company leads to an agent with one simple post-it note. (laughs) Uh, this was, this was, I don't remember if it was 2014 or 2015. We had an agent on our team who was a good agent. I think all agents are, are Mm well-intended, um, super busy. Uh, he was our main listing agent and we had two leads come in, in the span of a day and it all landed on one post-it note that got put on his desk. And I wanted him to chase after, uh, those two at bats, our front desk gal, Kim answered the phone, uh, brought it directly, uh, to him, put it on his desk and he forgot to call them, right? ISAs are insurance policies on these, like this is a reputation deal. Like these reputation ones are the easiest ones to convert hands down bar none. This mm-hmm. somebody's like, Hey, I know, like, and trust you already. Just call me back. Mm-hmm. And the agent, because, uh, he was distracted, we sent, uh, we sent that post-it note to his desk. That post-it note sat for a week. And then we found out from a callback from those clients that they were pretty pissed that we didn't respond. And we lost uh, one list and I think it was a buy sell. And it was the two, to the tune of probably 30,000 bucks. And I think that post-it notes have killed so many tens and hundreds and millions uh, of, of dollars for us because we've had bad systems. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I tell that story is because we have to talk about that line in the sand of what goes to agents Mm -hmm. and what goes to ISAs. Correct. Robbie, do our agents receive leads? They do not. 
Okay, what do agents receive in an ecosystem like ours where they're averaging 30 PCSOI deals per agent? What do they receive from the company? They receive face-to-face -face appointments with the leads that were nurtured by the ISA. So they get a face-to-face -face appointment in the form of either a consultation in our office or what we call now strategy sessions, an in-house strategy session, a showing appointment, meeting at a third-party location, or what became common during COVID, of course, was Zoom, uh, a Zoom consultation or strategy session. So face-to-face -face is what we're going for almost every single time. And we're putting that directly in our agents' calendars. Um, Hatch, somebody asked, what is an ISA? ISA stands for Inside Sales Agents. Really, all it comes down to is an ISA is someone in our world who's paid a small base salary, and then they get a portion of the commission on every single deal that comes out of the agent's cut. And their job is to nurture our company leads until they're ready for an appointment and then get them in contact with our agents who can help them get what they need, want, or desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, great explanation. And in our world, an ISA is licensed as well. Yes, um, I always recommend it. I don't deviate from that. So it's usually not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I want to summarize what you said and make it really simple, folks. You need to write this down that if you want this to be successful and if you want huge PCSOI deals, that the only things your agents should be getting are appointments. Correct. They should not be getting leads. Uh, Robbie, what does it take to convert a lead? Let's, let's, because we're going to talk about PCSOI, which is a, a totally different skill set. Uh, what does it take to convert a company lead and what kind of response time is necessary? Yeah, so first off, speed to lead is of the utmost importance. It's the most important metric that we track, um, meaning when a lead comes in, we have to be getting to them as quickly as possible. Um, so a lead comes in, they've signed up, especially lower hanging fruit. You got to yeah, get- Yeah, if, if you're talking a, a Zillow- a realtor.com, a portal lead. Uh, those, are, those are very expensive leads that need immediacy on them. Correct. It, it's kind of like, I always make the joke that they're like Baruka from Willy Wonka. They want it and they want it now. Um, that's just how they're hardwired. Um, and that's becoming more and more normal hash because of the Amazons and the tech of the world of, if I can order food on my phone through Uber Eats or through Domino's app and it can show up, or if I can have something delivered in my house in a day from Amazon, why do I have to wait to hear something back from you? That's so, that's so let, 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 this, this is such an important thing. If I were to rank all of the national pizza chains, I'm going to say I'd put, uh, and I'm just going to talk about three. I'm going to put Papa John's first, followed by Domino's, followed by Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. But my family, every three weeks or so, we yeah. order Domino's because of their app, because of their speed, because how easy it is. I'd rather eat Papa John's. I mean, it's all crap, right? But like, I'd rather eat Papa John's, but their app sucks. Yep. And, and what you're saying here is speed to lead is so important. And, and an ISA's job is so important. What I'm mm -hmm. going to get really specific with you about, and Aaron has a question of like, hey, is this uh, gonna be about how to get the leads? It sure will, but yeah. we have to paint the picture first, okay? So stay with us here. I, I am going to preach until I'm blue in the face that your agents don't have the time and attention to give to that speed. They're out showing homes. They're out negotiating contracts and you're setting them up to have mediocrity with your lead conversion. And then you're also limiting them from going and getting PC SOI deals. Yes. See, it all ties together. If you're giving your agents leads, they are spending uh, all their time chasing leads and they're late to the party. They're giving mediocre service to them. You're overspending on that. And then you're not cashing out on your PCSOI opportunities. Amen. 100%. Yep. That, that, that's exactly it. And really for us, where we're at in our business, we just see things because our whole mindset is how do we scale something? And it is impossible for an agent to, or frankly, I don't know, lack of a term, to, to half-ass two things and then you get nothing, right? Yeah, just whole-ass one thing, yep. Yeah, you whole-ass one thing. And 
what we've seen, and the reason we're talking about this ISA portion is, it's exactly what Hatch said, those leads who can't be great at bringing in PCSOI business and chasing company leads. I think Eric, you're a really good example, right? <laughs> if I wanted Eric to chase company leads, there was no way you were ever going to do it. It was not something you were ever going to be great at, right? And that's what we've seen is if you want to convert company leads to the highest level, get an ISA. You can transition to it with agents, but if you want higher levels of lead conversion and you want more PCSOI business, which is, let's just call it what it is, free business for the company. That's what PCSOI business is. Free mm -hmm. business for the company compared to leads you have to go and purchase. Um, you got to have your company leads or not be distracted by them. So the webinar topic today, and I want to make sure everybody's with us because Robbie and I haven't even scratched it yet, is how to help your agents bring in 30 plus PCSOI deals per year. Yep. That is the topic. And if you have the wrong system, giving them the right tools and the wrong system won't work out. Correct. You will not get 30 plus PCSOI deals from anybody if they're chasing leads. You won't. There's, there's, just, there's just no possible way. Okay. So taking all this, we're going to pivot and shift now. We've painted the picture. We've laid the groundwork. We've gotten the foundation. Uh, Dan Inman asked the question here, and he said, uh, what percent of our deals uh, for our company now uh, are company deals and what percent are agent deals? We have inversed this because back in 2015, 2016, as we were growing, we were 60% ISA deals and company deals. 40% PCSOI. And I was a big driver in that because again, I was doing 50, 60, 70, 80 PCSOI deals a year, um, even when I wasn't in production. Today, our company is 60% SOI deals and PC deals, 60%. That means of the thousand deals that we're doing this year, we're seeing 600 of those came from our agents that they're procuring. Mm -hmm. And it has been wild. So I want to walk you through how all this came to be. 2014, Hatch Realty opened up. We're brand new agents. And we were, we were changing the philosophy because we had one agent on our team who was the top producer. He had come with me because I, I, I was with Keller Williams before. I got kicked out. Everybody left except for two people. I had one agent who was kind of a middle ground player for production and then one admin. That happened in 2013 and 2014, we had hired a bunch of agents and we opened up Hatch Realty. And Jamie, who was our agent at the time, uh, who had come with us, had done like 24 deals in his first full year. And then he did like 30 deals. And in our head, we're like, man, 30 deals? He, he broke the barrier. We didn't think 30 deals was possible for an agent on a team. Then we had a hotshot come in named Brandon. Brandon uh, was fast moving and smooth talking and a hustler. Brandon did 49 deals in his first year and he did uh, 10 or so of those from his sphere. we never had an agent do 10. So it was like, oh man, we found ourselves a leprechaun. <laughs> in year number two, Brandon did like 70 deals, uh, but he did like 18 or 16 from his own sphere. And he came to me and he said, hey, I'm doing a lot of deals for my sphere. I want to make more money for my sphere because I'm now bringing in more than the lion's share. Can I make more money for my sphere? And I, I answered this so strategically because I used to be an agent on a team. And when I was an agent on a team, I had that exact same conversation with the team leads. I, I was the top producer. I was a part-time agent, but I was the top producer and I was bringing in 70% of all the business from my own sphere. And I said, Hey, I'd love to find a way to make more. How do I do that? And they said, that's not how we're built. And I said, okay, I understand. And I left the team 30 days later because I had no growth opportunity. But when Brandon said to me, hey, I, I want to figure out a, a way that I can make more. Can I make more for my sphere? And I said, yes. It's a yes, comma, when. Please write that down because you have to start changing the philosophy and your mentality of what it's going to take for a greatness and, and an expansion of your ecosystem to happen. And it happens when you say yes, when. So what I did is I said, all right, I'm going to use very generic splits on this. And this is not the splits that we necessarily adhere to at Hatch Realty, but it will help to paint the conversation. Brandon was on a 50-50 split. 
If the ISA touched it, Brandon would pay the ISA 8%. So company gets 50, Brandon gets 42, ISA gets eight. I said, man, Brandon, my profit margin is like 20% if I do this really well. And if you do 20 transactions in a year that are from your sphere, deals 21 and beyond, I'm going to give you all my profit because you have done your fair share of contributing to the company and you deserve to make all this extra money. You do 20 plus sphere deals, deals 21 and beyond, you make that extra money. And in my head, y'all, I'm thinking, nobody's going to do 20 sphere deals. Are you kidding me? I hadn't seen it in a real estate team. There are people who have coached me and have large, large, large voices in the industry that say that an agent will do up to 24 deals in a year. And if they get better than that, they're going to leave your team and you just hit restart and you start over. And I'm like, hell no, I don't want that life. I don't want that kind of team. And so when Brandon challenged me and he said, how are we going to get there? I'm like, yeah, man, let's get there together. And I'm going to pay you more. I want to. I want you to make more money, Brandon. And that is a core fundamental of my heart is we have to have the ecosystem where I want everybody to have big friggin' lives. It's not about how much I can hold on to. It's about how much I can give. And if I can get 20 sphere deals from Brandon and then I give him the rest, he wins, I win, and hot damn, we got a stable full of racehorses now. If you have a stable filled with donkeys and one racehorse, that ass is going to run slow or excuse me, that racehorse is going to run like a bunch of asses. But if you have a stable filled with racehorses and a couple of donkeys are in there, those donkeys are going to run faster than they ever have before. See, your ecosystem and who's there matters. I'm going to give you strategies and techniques, but you have to understand that the right tools in the wrong ecosystem will not get you there. Robbie, am I right or am I right? You're right, 100%. All right. So the first thing we did is we changed and we dangled the carrot. We created an incentive that somebody can make more on their sphere with a yes when. Robbie, should we immediately give somebody more for their sphere on deals one through 19 or deals one through nine, whatever that bonus system may be? Should we just incentivize sphere and pay somebody, if, it, if we're normally 50-50, should we pay them 60-40 or 70-30 on their sphere the moment they bring in one sphere deal? Absolutely not. Not needed. Why? I just think it's, it's not needed. You have your hard costs. I think it's an expectation in our world. And I mean, I will get to this later, but you have to earn the right to be on our team and, and do this as a barrier to, to become an agent on our team, frankly. Um, I, I think it's it's just not needed to do. What Rather, what you need to do is you need to create that carrot that pushes somebody to get to that point and motivates them. And Hatch, you're getting at something that, that I, I love talking about in business, which is known as the Bannister effect. You know what the Bannister effect is, Hatch? I do. Right. Roger Bannister was the first man to ever run a mile in under four, four minutes. And prior to that, people said it was humanly impossible. People could not do it. And really what happened here with Brandon and this whole story was it was the Bannister effect in play of, Oh, all these preconceived notions that we had was these things can't happen. Then what we realized was, holy goodness, if Brandon can do it, why can't other people mm -hmm. over and over and over again? I just don't think you need to pay on those first, first 15 or 20. Rather, be very generous at 20 so people have something to push towards. So really what yeah. we're getting at is, Two things. One, agents need to have the time and ability to focus on PCSOI lead generation, right? That's what we said first. Number two is you got to have a reward system that incentivizes the behavior to go and pursue those higher numbers. And it's shocking how people will actually get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the banister effect is such an important piece to understand in this is somebody's going to have to lead the way and show what is, what is actually possible to change the narrative for everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think most of your ecosystems, if you're watching this, you putting that out at 20 deals is going to help because right now you probably have most of your people at zero, one or two sphere deals. And so I think what I'd say is maybe if somebody gets to five sphere deals, on deals six through 10, you give them an extra 5%. Mm -hmm. 
And then if they get to 10 sphere deals uh, on, on deals 10 through 15, you give them an extra 10%. And on deals 15 through 20, you give them an extra 15% and deals 20 and beyond, you give them an extra 20. But like, if it's, if it's such a, like, remember Brandon was at 16 and I said, if we get to 20, that's going to change the game. If you're at one or two sphere deals for your team members, make it so that they, they can taste it so they can see it so they can actually get there. All right. So now let's talk about what an agent's habits look like. Uh, by the way, uh, Jim Black has this question. Do your agent self-generated leads count towards their sphere? Uh, outbound calls uh, to expireds or FISBO? Um, all, maybe. Uh, I, I think every ecosystem is different. And I want to be clear on what we at Hatch Realty define as sphere and where I messed up. Okay. What I define as sphere currently is anything that the agent procures. So open house leads, referrals that they get, whether it be from my past clients or their past clients or current clients, um, and then anything from their sphere of influence. The mistake I made is I also said to them, if a Zillow deal, as an example, if a Zillow deal comes in and it's a company deal, that first counts as a company deal. But if they come back to you, it counts as your deal. Okay. That was the mistake that I made is I, I told them that if you've earned that relationship and they come back to you, that now counts as a company deal. That was a mistake that I made. And I don't think that I should have done that, you know, looking back. Now, I'll never kick myself for overpaying an agent so long as I'm hitting my margin. Robbie, you and I talked about this a couple of days ago that I'd say that I'd rather have 15% of a watermelon than 35% of a grape. And so if you're growing something really big, it makes sense that you can uh, incentivize your agents. And, and it has been, you know, maybe it hasn't been a mistake because we, I haven't lost a producer outside of one person in the last two and a half years, two and a half years. Uh, I've only lost one producer and she had been with me seven years, you know? So uh, uh, I, I, I think that Jim, to your question, um, an agent outbound calling an expired or, expired or a FISBO, I might not pay that as an SOI deal, or you can maybe count it as like a half, right? You can give them half or partial credit. Cause again, you want to incentivize people to go and be hungry and to bring, to bring some things to the table. And Hatch, let's, let's give a little more color to that. So it, it, in our model, our ISAs are essentially chasing those opportunities almost Correct. always anyway. So you'd be competing with our ISAs, no offense to our agents. They're probably going to lose that game all day long in terms of speed and quality of the conversation. Um, the vast majority of these SOI that we're referring to would be a combination of the friends and family. And it kind of goes through seasons. Early on, it's probably more heavy on open house, frankly, uh, where they're getting things from open houses, um, open house opportunities that are coming in, friends, family. But another big place that our agents are getting SOI deals um, would simply be referral groups. A lot of our agents have referral groups they've joined or usually actually joined and then created their own because most referral groups are meh, right? I think it's probably almost every one of our top producers runs their own referral group yep. and they get 15 deals or more from it, 20, 30 deals in some cases from that referral group annually. Um, so it's really self-generated is really the term or, and self-procured is the thing that we've used. And you're right. The, the one thing that we've done and potentially messed up on in hindsight would be 2020. We might be sitting here and saying, man, where we messed up is we didn't count that. And our agents didn't have an incentive. Who knows, right? On the yep. counter argument. But what I'll yep. say is it's, it's past clients, it's friends, family, referrals, groups, that's where I would say the vast majority of these PCSOI business is coming from. Would you agree with that, Hatch? Yeah, 100%, 100%. And, and when it comes to deciding what is labeled as PCSOI and what is not, once you giveth, you cannot taketh away from an agent <laughs> because you're now eroding a massive amount of, of trust. Uh, I will say that uh, new agents that come into your ecosystem don't have to adhere to the old rules. So that's one of the ways in which you can healthily make that uh, a, a different piece. For us, we've chosen not to touch it because I'm, again, pursuing 15% of a watermelon.
Um, let's talk about the normal day of our agents because this will now start showing you where their time goes. 8.30 a.m., they're role-playing from 8.30 until 9.15. They are practicing. Uh, and, and if you haven't done so, check out uh, hatchcoaching.com. And in the drop-down menu, we have something called the Realtor Workout of the Day. In addition to that, and Robbie, would you please post it here, uh, a link to uh, our, our role-playing game? Because role-playing should be well thought out, and you should have a plan to go after it, Okay. The role plan that I want you to think out is uh, uh, in a game that we've created. It's a product that you can choose to purchase. We're not trying to sell crap here, but it's a really great resource. And those that use it and use it well, rave about it. And so um, figure out what is it going to take for you to uh, role play really well. From 9.15 till 10.45, that's that realtor workout of the day that I'm talking about. And our agents have a plan on who they're contacting and they are relentless on lead generating for 90 minutes a day. Now, some people say I, I lead generate for four hours a day or three hours a day, but that's inconsistent, not disciplined lead gen. And where our team gets really, really intentional is we make sure that our lead gen, which is not chasing company deals, but is going after their SOI deals, they are relentless with it. And so they're texting them, they're calling them, and the likelihood of somebody actually picking up the phone is pretty great. A conversation with a buddy should last 20 minutes. A conversation with a lead should last 30 seconds or 15 minutes. And there's no in between, right? A conversation with a buddy may last 20 minutes because you're not calling to try to milk them for business. You're trying to bring intentional value to their life. Every time you call somebody, it should be a call to give, to give affirmation, to give support, to give encouragement, to give a, a time in which you can connect and just be buddies. You have to win the relationship. Most of the time, we're in pursuance of people that don't know us, like us, or trust us. And instead, we're in pursuance uh, of, of hard work and like relationship building. You already have that relationship and you don't need to sell in a hard sort of way to your, to your friends. Robbie, what's the danger in transactionalizing the relationships that you already have? Let's just, let's put ourselves in the shoes here, right? I think there's two, two, two stories quick I want to share that are the danger of transactionalizing people. Number one is the common thing that happens in real estate is I work with a real estate agent. I close on my house. I see that that agent got paid $7,000 or 10 or 15 or five, whatever the number is. And then I hear nothing. That's the number one thing that is the, the biggest sin that you all are doing right now that people fall into in real estate is, and I know I'm speaking to you and I'm being the person, the voice that you need to hear today is you have now transactionalized somebody. They were worthwhile to you because they were a transaction. And now they've heard nothing from you afterwards, right? That's one thing. The second thing though is Imagine if you're getting a call from a friend or family member and you haven't heard from them or from a, uh, somebody that helped you with a good or service and they're not reaching out to give, they're reaching out to clearly take from you. If you partake in that call, what do you want to do? You want to walk away. You want to run, right? So I think you have to use empathy or you got to put yourself in the shoes of if I were in the shoes of my friends or family if my cousin and calls me and asks me who do I know that's looking to buy or sell real estate, you know what I want to do? I want to get off that phone as quickly as possible. It makes me feel gross, especially if that's the only time I hear from them. If I had an agent help me buy a home and I've heard nothing from them for two years and they call and say, hey, I'm in this, this competition. Who I know is looking to buy or sell real estate? No, no, no. I was a transaction to you. I don't feel like you actually care about me. So I think we have to put ourselves in the shoes of if we were in their shoes, if this stuff happened to us, don't do things that would piss you off, right? Do the things that would matter. Call your people. I just call it simply put, you put a lot, put a lot more words to it, Hatch, which are really good. Check in, see what's going on in your people's lives. Show people love, mm -hmm. right? Love, you know. And, and Yeah, let, 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 me, let me say this, Robbie, is I yeah. think that... Uh, your greatest CRM as an agent is not Sierra Interactive and it's not Boomtown and it's not Chime. 
your greatest CRM is your Facebook page because you have your entire sphere and database telling you what's going on in their life. Yep. And if you want to win your lead generation time, your realtor work out of the daytime, which should be a minimum of 90 minutes a day, uh, five days a week, you should be taking the things that you see online and connecting offline with it. Mm -hmm. It is a simple strategy. Uh, you don't need to be the most uh, unbelievable person that people are interested in. You need to be the most interested person into everybody else. Huh? Let's talk about this. Uh, the MREA, the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, what it has done is it has defined how we run our teams. And one of the pure things that's in there that so many people forget about is it talks about lead conversion. It says that a have not met, somebody who is a purchase company lead, a have not met is going to convert, the likelihood of it converting is one in 50. That's 2% a year. Now, a Zillow or a realtor, truly a lead, that should convert at more like a 10 to 12%. Industry average is about eight, but I think it should convert at 10 to 12%. Somebody who is a met, somebody who is a friend, somebody who you have their email, their phone number, their social media, and you're connected with them, they say the likelihood of that person converting is two in 12. They don't say one in six. They don't simplify that fraction down. They say two in 12. One of those is a referral that that person is going to give you. The other is actual business that that person will give you. Uh, and so if for every 12 people in your database, you have a one in six chance of connecting with them, 16.67%. So if you have 120 people in your database, you should be able to close 20 deals from that. Look at how simple that is. 120 people that are in your database that you know really well, that you're connecting with, that you're bringing value to, and that you're making them feel important, you should be able to close 20 deals. So the simple math is this, is you need 180 people in your database. Simple, not easy. 180 people in your database to close 30 uh, PCSOI deals annually. Now, I've also heard that MREA2, Electric Boogaloo, MREA2, if you don't know, Break Into Electric Boogaloo, it's one of the best breakdancing movies of the 80s what? ever made. What was that? Never heard that in my life. Uh, Robbie, I want you to Google Break Into Electric Boogaloo. Somebody put in the chat box that that's the best breakdancing movie ever made ever because it is the best. But MREA2, which has been written but not released, has actually changed it. And they've now said that it's not two in 12, it's two in 20. Okay. I don't know. I haven't read it, but I've heard that from some KW people that they've said it's two in 20. So that means how many people do you need in your database? Well, it means that you need 300 instead of 180 in order to get to 30 deals from your PCSOI. And so here's what I'm going to say is the strategy for your PCSOI is you should have a customized, please write the word customized down. You should not automate those that you are in relationship with. I'll take a client event as an example, and I'm going to watch, watch how pissy I get about client events. We have next month, our pie day giveaway. We're giving away 2000 pies. We are the largest pie day in the country. And we can look to say, how many homes are we going to sell because of Pi Day? I'll tell you how many people I piss off because of Pi Day. And it's thousands because we end up transactionalizing and we end up automating it. What we do is we send our sphere an email saying, I really care about you. Please come and get a, a free pie. And then we text, we copy and paste a text message that just says, I really care about you. Please come and get a pie. Right. We're, we're, we're sending all this stuff out to them saying, I really care about you, but we're just copying and pasting. And I don't know about you, but when I get a copy and pasted email or a copy and pasted text message, I say, screw that dude. Like that guy, I, I give that guy how much money or I've, I've spent how much time caring about that guy or we've been good buddies. And now I just get an automated text message from him. That's bull crap, right? All your invites for Pi Day, you can automate some because you got to reach the masses. But if you're doing a client event and you want somebody to feel really cared about, I think it's on this flip side, okay? I think you call them. I think you send a customized text message. I think that you send them a video message through Marco Polo. I think that you send them uh, a, a video message on Facebook. You can use all these different platforms and send something that is customized. And all you have to do is be diligent with your lead generation. I said that you should have a customized plan 
for your sphere. Whether it's 180 people or 300 people, whatever math you're using, that's the number of people that you have to do this for. 300 people should get a minimum of 12 touches a year, 12 customized touches, okay? Touch number one through touch number six is a client event. Half of them are through client events and you should be doing two client events a year at minimum. That is a phone call, a customized text message, a video to invite them. Then they show up to the event. By the way, you maybe have to do that three or four times to actually get them to respond. And even if they're a no, it still counts as a touch because you made them to say, I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm valued, I care for. And that is fundamental with what you need to make your past clients and sphere of influence feel. This guy cares about me. Caring really comes in the small, not in the big. Okay, the big is big and flashy and it's the way we automate it, but you need to make that person feel cared for. So the first is in the invitation. The second is when the actual event comes. So those that show up, that counts as a touch because you're getting face-to-face -face connection with them. Those that don't show up, well, guess what? You're following up with them and say, and you say, hey, I missed you at the event. I know it was our big pie day, but I was really hoping you could show up. I see you, I care about you, you matter. And if you're sending a text message, you got to put personal stuff in there. Otherwise they think it's automated because it probably is. Then the third touch is the follow-up after the event, a week or so after. Hey, I wanted to check in and see how your Thanksgiving was. Uh, I know I invited you to Pi Day, you weren't able to make it, but I just want to see how Thanksgiving was, okay? If they showed up, you call and you say afterwards, how was the pie? If they didn't come or didn't RSVP, or if they RSVP'd, no, you say, hey, I, I missed you. I wish we would have connected because I, I was just excited to see you because I see what's happening on social media in your life. And you take online, offline, okay? You do two client events a year, and that allows you six touches, half your touches for all these people. Robbie, how are we doing so far? I think you're killing it. And I think I want to get to the point here is, as a business, what we are trying to do with our client events is eliminate excuses for not reaching out to your PCSOI. That's it. That's all we're trying to do here is we're trying to make it unbelievably easy for them to reach out and just give value to people. Hey, do you want free stuff? I just censored myself. I almost said the other word. Um, I'm proud of myself. Hey, you want free stuff. And what's really funny is people a lot of times say yes to that. Uh, so we do Pi Day to see you all know. The other major event that we do is something called Date Night. We do that right before um, Valentine's Day where we give people free pizza, a bottle of wine, a growler, or six pack of beer or two liters of soda. Um, and what we do, just so you all know, to help offset some of the costs of this is we have vendor partners that help pay for it. So financial managers, you can mortgage, title, uh, heck, daycare, right? You can partner with your a daycare town. Look for strategic partnerships that would want to be a part of a really cool event uh, like this. And we'll probably even have more people come to date night traditionally than we do at Pi Day. So I'm be surprised if we weigh 2,100 to 2,200 pizzas. And funny story, if you all want to go see this, go to Hatch Realty on Facebook, go to videos, and you can see a video of our team giving out 1,900 pizzas last year. And it was what, negative 10, negative 15 degrees out. So you'll get a, yeah. lot, see a lot of frozen Fargo, a lot of uh, Eric's frozen face. Um, and it's just what we're doing is we've eliminated this idea of, I don't know what to say to my past clients or friends. Well, it's very simple. Eric, I love you, man. Wanted to reach out. We're giving away free pie. And dude, I wanted to give you one. Is that something that you, you and Sarah would be interested? There you go. Don't overcomplicate it. Personalize it, but don't overcomplicate it, friends. Yeah. Give people free stuff. And here's what you're doing. Every time you touch someone like this, you're building mind share with people. That's all that's happening here. You're going to take up that space in their mind. Why? Because you make them feel important, valued, and loved. You make them feel like they matter because they do. That's all we're doing with these first six touches. Awesome. So we've done six. The next two uh, are really easy. Birthday and anniversary. Okay. I, in fact, I, I don't think wedding anniversary is necessary. I think house anniversary for your past clients. 
Yep. If not house anniversaries, then I'll add one to the to the last four here. But what is irresponsible to do is when it's somebody's birthday that you post on their Facebook wall, happy birthday. I had 500 people post on my Facebook wall this year. I couldn't okay. tell you one of those people. Yep. Yep. Not one. Uh, and I'm not saying to uh, I'm not saying to send that person a text, or I'm not saying to uh, send that person uh, a, a direct message through social media. Again, hundreds, if not dozens, of text messages and, and, and direct messages come when it's your birthday. I can't tell you one of them. I'm talking that you can do one of two things or both: phone call, handwritten note. That way you're making that person feel special. I got four phone calls on my birthday this year. And I can tell you exactly who it was. Four phone calls. And in fact, it's two of the same friends every year because uh, I, they, they play into this game and they know the value of relationships. And so the happy birthday call is like, hey, happy birthday. I have a thing and Robbie loves it is, is I'll send somebody a video message or I'll call them and I'll scroll through my Facebook feed every day. And Facebook tells us when people's birthdays are. Yesterday, four of my close friends had birthdays. I saw one of them in person, but the other three I called and I sing this stupid birthday song. Here's how it goes. Happy birthday, oh, happy birthday. Oh, sin and sorrow everywhere, coronavirus in the air, but happy birthday. Oh. Robbie, happy birthday, man. I love you. I haven't talked with you in a while, but uh, now I'm thinking of you and you make me smile. So have a good one, right? Stupid memorable, repeatable. I don't have to be creative on it because it's the same stupid song I sing to everybody. And then I change the song up annually, right? Because I know I can't sing the same song next year. And the reason why I know is because I, I called my niece on her birthday and I sang that song. She's like, yeah, you sang that to me last year. I'm like, damn it. I got to get a new song. So uh, birthdays and it's a phone call or it is a handwritten note. House anniversaries, same thing. Phone call or handwritten note. That is covering eight of the touches. We have but 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna start talking fast if I haven't talked fast before. The last four touches are taking social media that you see online and bringing it offline. If somebody hasn't posted, you call and you're like, hey man, I was creeping on your page. I just haven't seen any updates. I wanted to see how you're doing. How's the wife? How's the kids? Uh, how's work? Awesome. Yeah, hey, I don't have any agenda. You wanna go get a beer sometime? Or, hey, I saw you just posted that your family member's sick. Man, I care about you a lot. How you doing? Right? Thoughts and prayers are a great thing to have, and I believe in the power of them, but I also believe in the power of putting those in your hands and activating them, making somebody feel cared for, okay? Four times a year, that is, if you have 250 business days in the year, that means that you have uh, 62 and a half days per quarter, Six and, 62 and a half days per quarter to contact 300 people. That means you got to call five friends or past clients each day. That's it. Five contacts a day for up to 300 people in your database. And you need to call them four times a year. Five calls a day to do 30 sphere deals. Now, in year one, I don't expect somebody to be at 30 sphere deals. Uh, somebody who's new to the business is going to take a little while, right? It's going to crescendo up, but you need to incentivize them, teach them how, provide for them the space in which to do so, so that they can execute. Outside of this, this person needs to be involved and active in their community. We used to have it as a standard, and I'm thinking about bringing it back again, where you have to be involved in some sort of group, a referral group, a church group, a social group, a club that you're in, something that gets you connected with people outside of just ancestrally being in real estate all day, every day especially if you're new to a community, you got to go out there and earn it. And then there's open houses, open houses. These are people raising their hands saying, I'm looking for some, I'm looking for a house. Who's going to be the person to woo me and win me over who love me some open houses. And it is the way in which you are going to win and win so bigly. If you are a new agent or trying to build your PC SOI business. So all of these things. Brent Germany says, what do you say to agents who say they don't have a sphere? They move to town. If I'm new to a town, if I, if I were to move to Dallas, Fort Worth and hang out with Brent Germany and I didn't know a soul, I'd work every open house and I go and I join a bunch of referral groups and I get connected with people. And then I go and join a gym where I'd make some friends. 
I played basketball in the same noon basketball league for about 10 years. And I probably sold 30 houses to those schmucks, right? I found some good team members. I've sold 30 houses to those schmucks because I just did what I love, but I was intentionally social. You have to teach your team members and you have to discipline yourself so that you got to go out there and make that opportunity happen. Sitting idly by and chasing company leads is disrespectful. The average, this, I, I don't know the step verbatim, but I know that they say like 70 or 80% of people say that they're going to work with their realtor again uh, after they, they do the transaction, right? I, I love that person. I'm going to work with them again. And then we don't contact that person or we just send them an annual calendar saying, oh, it's the first of the year. Here's a calendar to put on your fridge. And we expect that person to bring us a ton of referrals. It's irresponsible, y'all. We got to be better and we got to teach our team members and we ourselves have to be better about chasing after this PCSOI stuff. Now, the final piece that I'm going to say, and then Robbie, I'll give you some final thoughts, is your ecosystem has to continually reward, award, and incentivize people to grow big lives. And your ecosystem has to become so robust and you as a leader have to be intentional on building runways for people, helping them to have big wins. Because people will say, what happens if I have a bunch of agents that are really well trained and I know they can go feed themselves? Like, aren't they gonna be flight risks? And I'm gonna say, what happens if that person stays and they're not well trained? That's the kind of world I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of having great people leave me and it has happened before and it will happen again, but I have to consistently improve my leadership skills to keep that person around. I have to continue to teach them, inspire them, motivate them. But most importantly, I have to build a runway for them. They're not building a runway for me. I'm building a runway for them and I work for them. Great leaders work for their people. They don't work for them. And so your ecosystem has to be the right system for these people to win. And then sure enough, you can have a little of the world that we have. Robbie, final thoughts. Um, first off, I love it when you just get rolling, bring some hatch fire and some good stuff. Um, I, wa I want to say a few, few other things. One thing that we started doing about, what was it, seven years ago, six, seven years ago was we really transitioned away from hiring brand new agents because what we recognized is simply the fact that we were hiring people in an incompetence. What I'm going to say here is something I firmly believe. By the way, every agent that's in our ecosystem is a brand new agent, but you're talking about the role that they're going to play. Yes, 100%. Exactly. Yeah, yes. Very good point. Yep. Um, I'm talking about playing the role of agents. In, in our world, um, rather, people come in as a showing partner. They get paired with one of our really great agents or in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, and then they build their business underneath um, that other agent. And really, the main graduation piece that's required for them to become an agent on our team that receives direct company deals from the ISAs is they have to be able to create and generate their own business. It's a hurdle they have to demonstrate to us and jump over to show us that they're ready to play ball in our ecosystem. And here's what I'll tell you is, this is a thing that I think actually separates agents from those that make it from those that fail, is can you generate and create your own business? I think it's a thing that separates those that stick in the business from those that disappear from the business. If we boil it all down to the simplest common denominator, it's not your service, it's not your splits, none of that stuff. It's can you generate business from people? Can you convert business? And all we're doing here is we're giving you ideas on making this a pillar and a foundation within your business. Whether you're a solo agent, that's looking to do this, quit worrying about what lead source do I need to go buy and start thinking about what leads can I create for my PCSOI. That's what you need to shift in your mind. If you're a team and you're sending your company leads to your agents, stop blaming your agents for not converting leads. Start blaming yourself. It is not their fault, it's yours. It's the models. You need ISAs in your world to get the highest levels of lead conversion. And then what we can do is we can pivot them and say, hey, 
You don't stop lead generating. That's one of the biggest misconceptions about our team. Eric said it earlier, 60% of our business, and that's kind of always balanced around. It's been as low as 40% up to 60, and it kind of goes up and down as the ISAs are performing as well. But the biggest misconception is, man, all your business must be from these ISAs. No, nothing can be further from the truth. Historically, it's been half and half. Because our agents make it an emphasis. And that's what you all need to do is make it an emphasis in your world. It's got to be of the utmost importance. Here's why, friends. We are about to go through some major shifts in real estate. We keep hearing more about how low-hanging fruit leads that so many people are reliant on, the Zillows, the Realtor.coms. One of two things are happening. One, the prices keep going up like rent, right? You're renting these leads, all right? Go buy and own property, friends. It's, a, it's normal. Go create your own leads. You own that stuff. Okay, quit renting it from Zillow and these other sources. Not to say that we do it as well, but don't make that your only lead source. But secondly, there's a lot of chatter that those lead sources are going to disappear altogether. And if your business is so fundamentally dependent on these lead sources, I have to tell you something that's really inconvenient. You're screwed. Absolutely screwed. You have to find ways to out relationship tech companies. It's the only way you're going to win, all right? So start building these relationships, start showing people love, build mindshare with your people. So when they want to buy a house, even if they're looking at homes on Zillow, they're like, I gotta reach out to my boy Hatch, because that dude, he gave me free pizza and free beer and, and free pie. I wanna work with him. That's what you all need to be thinking about is how do you out relationship bigger companies? It's the only way you're gonna win. And I'm done now. Preach, buddy. Gang, we used all our time. If you need anything from us, go to hatchcoaching.com. Uh, we spit some fire today. Uh, we want you to take a look. So we're going to email out just some final details to you. But hey, God bless you. Go do some good. See y'all.